the title of the message this morning is How to Get Things from God. How to Get Things from God. You're going to see there's a huge difference between what the Bible says that I'll be bringing out and what the TV evangelists say about how to get things from God. Big difference. Big difference here. Okay, Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. And by the way, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, giving me, speaking these words. And this is in the, the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. So keep those thoughts in mind, too. In fact, I'm going to begin reading in verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Talk about things, and notice how many times the word things is used here. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Now verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not. Let the bird be an example for us, he's saying. Neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Every time you see a bird, you should be encouraged, not discouraged. Now verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? No, he can't. Verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment, clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, because of these lessons and these examples that the Lord gives, therefore, here's a conclusion he's drawing. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things, those are just things. Do the Gentiles seek? So the people around us, the lost people, the ungodly, the non-Christians, the Gentiles, as they're called here, these are things that they seek. Now, what are these things that they seek? Food and clothing. Basically, that's what he's covering here. For all these things do the Gentiles seek, food and clothing. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. God knows you need food and clothing. Doesn't he? Sure does. Now verse 33. Here's my main verse. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought. Now that means don't overly worry about these things. That's what he's saying. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Heavenly Father, please help me as I preach this morning. Bring these thoughts out that everyone here can benefit and uh, learn something this morning about your provision, but also uh, that we need to be in the right place to have your provision and your blessing here. So help me as I preach this morning. May the Lord be honored and may spiritual needs be met. Help me as I preach, please. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Things, things, things. Food and drink here are called things. But also spiritual things are called things here too. There's an importance to them. Now, I'm going to tell you about how to get things from God this morning. But it's not going to be at all like maybe what you've heard from other people. I'll just keep it general like that. From other people. I'm going to give you five conditions to getting what you need from God. The conditions mean they must come before uh, what you need and what you want from God. These things must happen first before you can get the things from God. Five conditions here. All right, the first word in verse 33 is the word but, which means it's saying it's contrasting it, contradicting it from the way others live. 
verses 25 to verse number 32. The Lord was talking there about how the world lives, how they want the things. They want food, they want clothing, and how they spend themselves to get those things. If they don't get all they want, they worry about it. Their time is taken up just worrying about those things and getting those things. And we know according to the one verse, it says, you have need of these things, but God knows you have need of these things. See, God knows that. God knows you have to have food to eat. God knows you need clothes to wear. God knows those things. But there's a difference in how you get them. The world has one way to try to get them, but the Christian people have a whole different way. That's why that verse, first word in verse 33 is the word but. But it means it's contrasting what was just been said, is that there's going to be a change, there's going to be a difference here. But it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. The world's way is to major on things. The world's way. They major on those kinds of things. The world has its ways, but God has his ways, and they are very different. Very different. Now, first word there. Now, like I say, you can take the word of God, and you're reading it through. You can look at every verse. You can look at every phrase in that verse. Uh, many times, you can look at every single word in a verse and get something from every single word. But look at, the, like, look at verse 33 there. The first word is but. That means there's a contrast from what the Lord was talking about, uh, that Christians are going to be different in this area of getting things. They're not going to get things like the world get th gets things, but Christians are going to be different in how they get things. So the word but is an important word. Then it has the word seek. Now that's an interesting word, important word I'll be talking about here. That's the second word. That word itself can be preached about. We need to seek the right things. We need to seek certain things. We need to seek not the wrong things. The word seek is an important word. Then it's the word ye. The word ye is the plural form of you. Like in the, all the other English translations, you won't get that distinction, but you will in the King James Bible get the, get the distinction. Ye is plural of you. Ye versus you, which is singular. Ye, so that means it's applying to us personally, but seek ye, here's something ye you ought to do first. And then it prioritizes the word first is a priority. Put these things first, first, before all other things. And then, but seek ye first. Every word there is important, isn't it? But seek ye first. And then there's a little phrase, the kingdom of God. And there's another phrase, and his righteousness. And then the promise is given. And all these things shall be added unto you. The word added, added, means you already have to have something to be added to it. And what do you have first? The first part of verse 33 is what you have. For the Christian, this is why it's so different from the world. Uh, the world wants to put things first. And then if there's, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me get back to my message here before I, I get to my final point already in five minutes. All right, first of all, there's different from the world. The first word that brings that point out, that we do things differently than the world does. We put God first in our lives. All right, the second word I'm going to bring up, which I've talked about a little bit already, is the word seek. Friends, you need to seek the right things. Now, people are out of a job, they're seeking a job. That's good. You need to seek, try to find a job. It's getting a little harder, I know that too. But you need to seek a job if you need a job. And so you need to actively be involved in trying to find a job which means you might make some phone calls, you might visit some companies, and you might put in some applications to try to find a job. So you're going to be actively involved. That's the word seek means, to be actively involved in trying to get a job. Now, some of the young people here or other people in our church, I have gone th through some education, and they're seeking an education. And that's a good thing. But you have to seek an education. You have to put forth some effort, don't you? You have to do that time to study, and you have to uh, pay for those books, and you have to do all those things, but you have to seek those things. Anything you achieve in your life, you have to seek. Very little, if anything, ever falls into your lap. Most things, if not everything in your life, you've gotten because you've sought for it. You seek after it, and then you get it. We must do the same thing spiritually. I wish, I wish I could just open up these church doors on Sunday morning and seekers would come flooding in. Wouldn't that be wonderful? 
Wouldn't that be great? I wish it was that case. Once in a while, we do find somebody like that. Somebody who was looking, somebody who was shaking, somebody who was intrigued about spiritual things, and, and their mind and their thoughts are centered on, are coming around on spiritual things like, what is the Bible? And, and why are we here? Why does mankind even exist? What is the whole purpose for our lives? Uh, what is this life all about? Who is there a God? And if there is a God, who is this God? And they start looking, and they start looking. That's the responsibility. That's what it says here in verse 33. You need to start looking. You need to start seeking. That's our responsibility. Like last Sunday night when I preached about Moses and the burning bush there, what he saw intrigued him, and he determined within himself to look into the matter more. Friends, that's what you need to do. Look into the matter more. Take some time, seek those things, ask around, read some things, even pray to God. You say, I don't even know if there is a God. That's all right. He knows your thoughts. He knows your intentions. You pray to him. He is there. He will listen to a sincere prayer. And if your sincere prayer is, Lord, help me to understand these things. Lord, help me to know you. Lord, help me to find out what is life all about. He will answer a sincere prayer like that, even if you don't know who God is. But you have to seek. It's not going to fall into your lap. Now, there's times when the Lord might do something in your life and cause you to think about something spiritual. Praise the Lord for that. But it says there, seek. That's what you need to do. That's what I need to do. We all need to do that. Seek these things. Look for these things. Now, look. don't lose Matthew, but turn forward to Romans chapter 3, verse 11. Are you looking, friends, are you sincerely looking, seeking, with an open heart to find truth, with a sincere heart? Romans chapter number 3, verse 11. I wish, I wish people would look more. You know, I go out every week, and many, obviously from our big three, many of you do too, go out every week and try to remind people they should be seeking these things. We are the ones that remind people, look for these matters, look for these things. Start looking into the Word of God, read the Bible. Why don't people read the Bible? Because they're not seeking. Yet the Bible says they need to seek. But there's a major problem here. Romans chapter 3, verse, let's begin in verse 9. Romans 3, verse 9. What then, are we better than they? No, in no wise. We have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are under sin. Now verse 10. As it is written, there's none righteous... No, not one. Now, it's starting a litany and a list here of, of how bad man is and how it shows why they're not spiritually right. As it is written, meaning you're referring to an Old Testament scripture here, there's none righteous, no, not one. So no one's good enough to go to heaven. Then verse 11, there is none that understandeth. Now, God gives understanding. The Holy Spirit of God gives light at times, but but man left unto himself would never understand it. But then it says, there is none that seeketh after God. Man in his natural state, in his natural state, would not seek after God. I'm glad people do seek after God. They, they understand that. They realize that God brings things into their life. God brings problems sometimes into their life. But sometimes they'll start looking. They'll have a, a, a little insight. They'll have a little light. They'll start looking for God. They'll start seeking truth. But for the most part, there's none that, that seek after God. And then verse 12, they're all gone out of the way. They're all going the wrong way. All those people out there that are not Christians, they're all going the wrong way. Every last one of them. Do you understand that this morning? Do you realize that this morning? Do you understand there's a difference here? Don't go that way. Come this way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way. The way is a person. The way is Jesus Christ himself. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. The word unprofitable is another, uh, almost a nicer way of saying worthless. Unprofitable means worthless. Well, that's not very complimentary there, Romans chapter 3, verse 12. You're not very complimentary. They're all gone out of the way. They are together, together become unprofitable. Uh, there is none that doeth good. No, not Not even one. 
not even one. Active seeking. There's none that seek after God. Seek after God. When God brings something in your life that makes you start thinking about spiritual things or thinking about the Bible or thinking about God or thinking about why we're here, follow up on that just like Moses did. He determined he was going to look into that matter. What is this burning bush that's not really burning up? It keeps on burning, but it never burns away. What a curiosity. Has God ever sent you a curiosity? Has God ever done anything in your life to get your attention and start to thinking about something spiritual? Maybe it was just driving by the, our church here and seeing that sign out front with some Bible verse on it. Maybe it was some Christian that talked to you. Uh, something that got your interest. Something that started you thinking about spiritual things. Friends, let me tell you something. Follow up on that. That was God working there. The Holy Spirit of God is drawing you. Don't fight it. Seek more. Just like Moses said, I will look into this matter. Do the same thing. So we need to, first of all, understand that God's ways are different from the world about success. Secondly, you need to seek those things. Thirdly, you need to prioritize spiritual things. Prioritize. It says there in verse 33 again, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So seek ye first. First. On the first day of the week, go out to church. Come out to church. First day of the week. Put God first in our, our lives. Put God first. You mean, well, let me put it this way. Putting God first means not putting him second. I've used this as an illustration before, but let me use it again. Uh, ladies, the ladies that are married here and the ladies that aren't married, you could picture this in your own life if the, this was what to happen. Ladies, what if your husband came up to you and said, you know, I love you, but there's another lady I love more than you. I'm not talking about their mother or something. I'm just talking about some other lady that caught his attention. She said, I, I love you, but uh, I love this other lady more, but you're second. Would you be satisfied with that? Ladies... If that's your husband, you want to be number one in his life. But he's but you're second. That's close. Would you be satisfied with that? Of course not. Neither is God. Neither is God. Prioritize, because again, seek ye first, first. Let this be the, your first desire. Let this be your, your main reason for living, first. Don't put God second. Don't put him third. Don't put him fourth. Certainly don't put him last. But a lot of people live that backward kind of life, don't they? They put God last. They put everything else first. They put this first, and they put every, all, even good things they put first. But God, God comes on kind of at the end, if at all. And it's kind of interesting, when you put him last... It seems like he doesn't uh, appear in your life at all. First, what is first in your life? What takes up your time first in your life? What takes up most of your attention most in your life? What takes up most of your affection in your life? What is number one uh, to, to uh, affection, to be, uh, uh, that has your affection in your life? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. First, the kingdom of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So who is first in your life? What is first in your life? God should be. Now, we want to get to the end of verse 33 where it says, All these things shall be added unto you. But don't forget the first part of that verse. The first part of the verse has to be true before the last part of the verse can be true. If you want to get things from God, all these things shall be added unto you. And you want those things from God. Uh, you want the food. You want the clothing. You want the, the, the jobs. You want the money. You want all these other things. The first part of the verse has to be true. But you have to realize to get these things, you're going to have to do it differently than others are. That's the first condition. The second condition, you have to be seeking it yourself, seeking spiritual things, looking after spiritual things. That's the second condition to getting God's blessing and his provision and his things. And the third thing, again, is prioritizing him. God is not satisfied with even second place. We must seek things for God and from God first before we even seek for things for ourselves. 
We need to reach a place where we put ourselves after God. God's first. Well, I guess it's the old little saying, you know, joy, J-O-Y. Jesus first, others second even, and yourself last. J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That should be true in our lives too. Honestly, isn't that hard though? Let's, let's be honest this morning. That's hard to put the Lord first in our life before ourselves, and that's what it takes. When we put the Lord first in our lives and we do these things, these conditions, God will give us the things that we need. But we have to prioritize our lives. And so many people are living a backward life. They're getting all the things in there first. And then if there's any time, time left over, then we kind of give God a little time. And we give God a little place in our lives after all the other things. First of all, we need to understand, put God First in our lives. I know I'm being repetitious. I know you're getting a little tired of hearing that. But I want to really hammer this home this morning. Put God first even before yourselves. Now, you know I like people coming out to church. Amen. What keeps people from coming out to church? They're tired on Sunday morning. Did you drag yourself out of bed this morning? I did. I did. My alarm kept going off. I only pressed their snooze alarm four times this morning. For me, that's pretty good. But I had to drag myself out of bed and get out of bed. I didn't even, I didn't feel, you know, in the mornings, I, I just don't feel, every, every morning, I don't feel like getting up. But I wanted to put the Lord first, not myself. So my tiredness and my desire to stay in bed, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to put my weariness and my tiredness and my desire to stay in bed second. Because I want to put God first in my life. Prioritizing our lives, putting him first. People live the backwards lifestyle. People live upside down. People need to reverse their lives and, and reverse the way they do things and put God, instead of being last, and put him in first. And the first things you have in first place, put those in the last place. We need to reverse, we need to turn our worlds upside down, or we need to stop living the backward life. Put him first. You don't understand what a blessing is going to be because once you put God first and you take care of his work, uh, his, his pleasing him, he's going to help you with the rest of your life. But if you put the rest of your life first and him last, well... He's not going to help you with the rest of your life. Only when he's first, first, involves priorities, doesn't it? Make that clear in your life. Put God first. All his things. Come out to church first. Uh, be faithful in reading the Bible first. Do all these things. Make that your priority in your life. And then God will give you all those T-H-I-N-G-S things. You want those things, don't you? You need food to eat. I do. We all do. You need clothes to wear. We all need those things. Here's the answer. Here's the remedy. Here's the prescriptions right from the Word of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Put God first. On Sunday morning, put God first. Not that golf course. Not washing and waxing your car. Not cutting your grass. You know, I, I drive around neighbor. I see some, some yards that are perfect. There's not one weed in their yard. The ground of the grass is all level, you know, perfectly level. And it's dark green grass. And then they have the flower beds. Usually they have uh, little borders of stones or something, just perfect. All their little shrubs are trimmed perfectly round, you know. They, they trim all their, just perfectly. And their flowers are, no, that's okay. That's, in fact, if I ever retire and have the time, that's what my yard is going to look like. But I'm telling you this this morning, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't look like that now. My yard doesn't look like that. We get the grass cut. I don't even do that myself anymore because I'm getting old and I've got an excuse not to cut it now. So I let someone else does that for us. And I, I take care of the flower bed, sort of. You know, in fact, I spend a whole lot more time here at church do, working in the out, outside than, than I do at my house. But someday I'd like to have my yard looking like that. But you know something? It's more important for me to, to study and get, get ready to preach on Sunday morning and Sunday night than it is to have my yard looking perfect. 
That's more important than I'm praying for people. I'm praying for the problems in people's lives and praying that God will bless our church and, and help us to be effective in reaching out and get, getting more people saved. It's more important, I, I'm praying about those things than having that perfect yard. As much as I, I love that perfect yard, I am, I am envious and I'm jealous of those people that do have those perfect yards. I almost drool driving by their, their house. In fact, I purposely drive down certain streets so I can see those beautiful homes. <laughs> I really do. I said, well, I can go this way where all the houses look like my house and the yards look like my yard. Or I can go down this other street where they're all just perfectly, you know, perfectly groomed, the outside. So I, I, drive, I drive by those houses and I kind of enjoy looking at their houses as nice as they are. But you know something? As much as I'd love to have my yard looking that nice, I've got more important things to do. I want to read the Word of God. I want to read good Christian books. I want to be ready here on Sundays when I'm preaching and teaching the Word of God and, and Wednesday nights when I'm, I'm talking about and teaching the Bible. And with great fellowship, we, I love our church here. I love the people in our church and all these different matters. And I'd like to see my yard looking better. And it's frustrating to me sometimes that it doesn't. But, not, by the way, you don't have to have a perfect looking yard either. But I'm just saying I like that. Personally, I like that. But this is more important than having that weedless, level, green grass, pretty flowers, trim shrubs in my house. This is more important. And I sincerely believe God has blessed me because I prioritize his work, his word, his will. And I believe he'll do that for you because of verse 33. Prioritize, prioritize. Now the next thought I want to bring up here. You must, your, does, your motive must be right. Your motive must be right. It's for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's our motive. That's our reason, for the kingdom of God. Don't lose Matthew, but turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Very well-known verse here, too. We need to live our lives to give God the glory. I know we hear in our church circles about our main goal is to get people saved. You know, that, that's an important goal, but that's not the main goal. Our main goal in our church is not to get people saved. Now, that is a goal, and that's an important one. But our main goal is to honor the Lord with our lives, to honor God. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all, everything, to the glory of God. Can you uh, work your job for the glory of God? Sure can. You can give a good example of where you work. Uh, can you eat breakfast to the glory of God? Sure. Pray before you eat and thank the Lord for the food you're about to enjoy. Do all to the glory of God. Our motive must be right. Our motive must be right. Sometimes people come to church because they got problems and difficulties in their life and they want God to help. That's a wrong motive, but I'll tell you this. Let me quickly add this. Let me quickly add this too. Some people have come to our church because they've had problems and they want to have uh, God to help them. That's a wrong motive. That's selfish motive. But some come to church because they have problems and they want God to help, but they hear what they need to hear. Now that problem has brought them here. They came with the wrong motive, but once they got here, they heard what they really needed to hear. And then some people get saved. Some people follow up on it. Some keep coming back. But, but the initial purpose was selfish. But when they got here, they heard something scriptural and they became spiritual. They came initially because of something selfish. When they got here, they heard something scriptural, and they became spiritual. That's the way it works sometimes. Now, sometimes people come to church because that's all they want. That's all they want is God to help them. They got some problem, and as soon as the problem is gone, so are they. That shows their hypocrisy there. As long as God answers their problem, uh, takes care of their problem, uh, gets rid of their problem, uh, helps them in the difficulty, and things start going good again, do you ever see them out of the church after that? Nope, they're gone. Why? Because their motive was wrong. 
Our motive is to glorify God no matter what happens to us. You think Paul was all that happy in those jails? You know something he was? Because he knew that was God's place for him in jail. Suffering for the Lord. Christians, we suffer for the Lord at times. Not to that degree, but we do. But there's an important condition if we want God things from God. We have, our motive must be right. And this really separates people. Our motive must be right because we want to give Him honor and glory, not because we're going to benefit in some way. Be careful of that distinction. Now, will God benefit us? Will God bless us? Sure, He will many times, but sometimes He tests us. Sometimes He will not give us what we would like to have. But I'll tell you this, if we'll put God first, then He will give us the things, T-H-I-N-G-S, that we need. Put God first. Check your motive. Why are you here in church this morning? Is it just because you're afraid not to be here? That God's going to bring some problem into your life if you're not faithful in church? Don't let that be your motivation. Let your motivation be because you love the Lord and you want to please Him. And He's just a wonderful God. You couldn't help yourself but come out to church. Let your motive be right. That's a condition to getting things from God. And then the last thought this morning is righteousness. There also needs to be righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We want the things, we need the things. But we need to meet the conditions if you want those things from God. And one of the strongest conditions here is personal righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, okay, and his, his, God's, Righteousness. Righteousness is the word holiness. Righteousness, right living, correct living, doing what's right, living the right way. We need to seek those things too. Learn how to be holy. Learn how to have victory over your sin. Now, Christian, we still have the old nature. It battles us and we give in. I know that. In, in thoughts and words and motives sometimes. Oh, I know that. I know that. I, I know that as much as you do. But I know this too, we need to be seeking personal holiness. We need to be better now than we were last year. Yeah, they call us legalists. You know what that is? Legalism are those that are criticizing Christians who want to live a sanctified life and want to live a separate life and want to live a holy life. That's what they criticize, the Christian that is sincere about his Christian walk. It's not legalism. You're not saved by doing good works. You're saved by the grace of God and believing what he has done and accepting that. But you have to repent of your sins. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not legalism. But after you're saved, they say, oh, it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter what your lifestyle is. You legalists. Legalism is really biblical sanctification, biblical separation, and biblical holiness. That's what it is. That's what it is. Now, in vows righteousness, people that say that's legalism, you know what they're really saying? I don't want God's personal or God's righteousness in my life. I don't want to live a holy life. I don't want to live a sanctified life. I don't want to live a separated life. Boy. But if you want the things from God, you have to do that. Verse 33, what a, what a blessing it is. Uh, here's one quote about that holiness. I thought this was good. You cannot expect God's blessings while being indifferent to the claims of holiness. You cannot expect God's blessings while being indifferent to the claims of holiness. People today, they want what Jesus has. They want what Jesus gives. They want things from the Lord. They want things from Jesus, but they don't want him. They want his blessing, yeah. They want his help, yeah. They want his provision, yes. They certainly want his salvation, yes. They don't want to go to hell. They want to go to heaven, so they want his salvation, yes. But they don't want him. You see, he is not only Savior, but he's also Lord. Lordship of Christ, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's also creator. He's the one that created this whole universe. He and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, they all had part in creation. He is the creator. You cannot be a Christian and be an evolutionist. If you're a Christian, you believe the Bible. And the Bible says God 
created. You cannot be a Christian and be an evolutionist because if you're claiming to be a Christian and say you believe in evolution, you don't believe the Bible. You can't be a Christian without believing the Bible, can you? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. People want his blessing, they want his help, they want his provision, they want, they want his protection, they want his salvation. But they really don't want him running their lives. You know, here on Wednesdays, we have several kids running around here, and they're, they really are great. Uh, so good to have them here. But they've kind of attached themselves, at least somewhat, to Pastor Andy. There's five in particular I'm thinking of. And they, uh, they come up, to, when I come in the building, they're usually here already. They come up running up to me. Oh, hi, Pastor. I just, some of them give me a little hug, you know. And I go, hi, how you doing? But then they, you know what the next question is? Do you have any candy? And now, I start to think, now, why do they like me? <laughs> why are they so friendly to Pastor Andy? Is it the candy I give them? Or is it because they do like me, period? You know what a test would be to find out the motive? No more candy. <laughs> then we find that they're still happy when they see me walk in or not, if, even if there's no more candy. Christian, you know sometimes God uses that same test with us. Do you really love me? Let's take away the candy and see what you do. People that they want Jesus, but do they want him just for what he gives? Blessing, help, provision, protection, salvation. But what if they didn't have those things? Would, they, would, you, would people still love the Lord and want to serve him? Take away the candy sometimes. Now, last thought, and I'm done this morning. Matthew 6, again, but there's a difference, difference from the world. God gives things to us, but it's different from the way the world uh, desires them and seeks them and gets them. But seek ye first, prioritize spiritual things, put, put spiritual things first, the Bible reading, the prayer, the church attendance first in your life, the kingdom of God, his righteousness, you have to have, to have a desire for holiness, and then these things shall be added unto you. I want to get things from the Lord. I don't want to thing, get things from Satan. Satan gives us things to tempt us. God gives us things for our blessing. Is there a difference? Big difference. Big difference. Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, may we search our hearts. Yes, Lord, we want things. We want things from you. We want to know that they're a blessing from you. And when we pray about them, we receive them. But Father, we, I pray everyone understood there's conditions of getting things from you. From Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then, and then only, all these things shall be added unto you. So, Father, help us to understand there's conditions to, to your blessings. And, Father, I pray that you'll bless. Now, as we search our hearts, as we have this invitation time, we pray for whatever spiritual needs people might have this morning, especially, or especially, not, well, especially those that still need to be born again, really believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, where they put you first, and they want to serve you, and they've turned from their sins, and and they, want, they believed and trusted in what Jesus has done for them. So, Lord, help them to understand that. May the Holy Spirit of God give understanding and illumination this morning. And bless this, this invitation time now. For it is in Jesus' name, in the Lord's name, wonderful name, we pray and ask it. Amen.